there was a king of the name Satrajit within the jurisdiction of Dwarka city. He was a great devotee of the sun god who had awarded him with the benediction of a beautiful jewel known as Syamantaka. Since he was a great devotee of the sun god, the good king gradually entered into a very friendly relationship with him. The sun god, who is called Vivasvan, was very much pleased with him and delivered to him an exceptional jewel known as the Syamantaka jewel. When this jewel was worn by Satrajit in a locket around his neck, it made him glow with such a dazzling effulgence that he appeared exactly like an imitation sun god. Putting on this jewel, he would enter the city of Dwarka, and people would think that Vivasvan, the sun god, had come into the city to see Krishna. They knew that Krishna, being the supreme personality of Godhead, was sometimes visited by the demigods. So, while Satrajit was visiting the city of Dwarka, all the inhabitants, except Krishna, took him to be the sun god himself. Although King Satrajit was known to everyone, he could not be recognized because of the dazzling effulgence of the Syamantaka jewel. Once, mistaking him to be the sun god, some of the important citizens of Dwarka immediately went to Krishna to inform him that the sun god had arrived to see him. At that time, Krishna was playing chess. Excellent move, Krishna. Hmm, it looks as if you've got my queen trap now, doesn't it? Hmm. Try this on for size. My dear Lord Krishna, you are the supreme personality of Godhead. And in your plenary portion of Narayana and Vishnu, you have four hands with different symbols. The conch shell, disc, club, and lotus flower. You are actually the owner of everything. But in spite of your being the supreme personality of Godhead, you have descended in Vrindavan to act as the child of Jasoda, who sometimes used to tie you up with her ropes and you are celebrated, therefore, by the name Damodara. My dear Lord, so auspicious is your presence in the city of Dwarka, that even the sun god Vivishwan has come from the heavenly abode just to see your lotus face. Thus they informed Lord Krishna that the sun god with his appealing bodily effulgence was coming to see him. Upon hearing the statement of the citizens, the all-pervasive personality of Godhead, Krishna, simply smiled. Being pleased with the citizens of Dwarka, Krishna informed them that the person... My dear friends, actually, this person whom you think is the sun god is King Satrajit, who has come to visit Dwarka city to show off his opulence in the form of the valuable Syamantaka jewel, which he obtained as a gift from the real sun god, Vivisvan. Satrajit, however, did not come to see Krishna. Instead, he was overwhelmed by the beautiful jewel of Syamantaka. He installed the jewel in a temple to be worshipped by the Brahmins. This is an instance of a less intelligent person worshipping a material thing. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that less intelligent persons, in order to gain immediate results from their fruitive activities, worship the demigods who are created within this universe. The word materialist means one concerned with gratification of the senses within this material world. And who would not worship the Syamantaka jewel? The jewel was so powerful that it was daily producing a large... My jewel is so powerful that it is producing more than 170 pounds of gold every day. Besides that, we learn from the Vedic literature that wherever this jewel, my jewel, is worshipped, there is no possibility of famine, pestilence, or disease. Lord Krishna wanted to teach the world that the best of everything should be offered to the ruling chief of the country. 
King Ugrasena, was the overlord of many dynasties, and he happened to be the grandfather of Lord Krishna. And Krishna asked Satrajit to present the Syamantaka. My dear Satrajit, since the best of everything should always be offered to the king, I humbly request that you present the Syamantaka jewel to King Ugrasena. But Satrajit, being a worshipper of the demigods, had become too materialistic. And instead of accepting the request of Krishna, he thought it wiser to worship the jewel. Why should I give it to the king? Hmm. I think it's wiser to keep the jewel and worship it in the temple in order to gain my 170 pounds of gold every day. <laughs> Materialistic persons who can achieve such huge quantities of gold every day are not much interested in Krishna consciousness. Sometimes, therefore, in order to show special favor, Krishna takes away great accumulations of materialistic wealth from the person and thus makes him a great devotee. But Satrajit refused to abide by the order of Krishna and he did not deliver the jewel to him. After this incident, Satrajit's younger brother, in order to display the opulence of the family, took the jewel and put it on his neck and rode on horseback into the forest, making a show of his material opulence. While the brother of Satrajit, who was known as Prasena, was moving here and there in the forest, a huge lion attacked him, killing both him and the horse on which he was riding, and took away the jewel to his cave. In a short time, the news was received by the gorilla king, Jambavan, who then came to the cave and killed the lion and took away the jewel. Jambavan had been a great devotee of the Lord since the time of Lord Ramachandra, so he did not take the valuable jewel as something he very much needed. Rather, he gave it to his young son to play with as a toy. When Satrajit's younger brother, Prasena, did not return from the forest with the jewel, Satrajit became very upset. He did not know that his brother had been killed by a lion. Krishna wanted that jewel, and just because I did not give it to him, he might have ambushed my dear brother in the forest and killed him, taking away my valuable jewel by force. Hmm. He must have done it. This idea grew and grew within Satrajit's mind until it was a rumor being spread by Satrajit into every part of Dwarka city. The false rumor that Krishna had killed Prasena and had taken away the jewel was spread everywhere like wildfire. I'm not one to gossip. Huh? Did you hear? Krishna actually stole the song and talked. That's not the half of it. He took it by force from Prasena and killed him in the act. Oh, oh, Krishna murdered Prasena. Krishna did not like being defamed in that way, and therefore he decided that he would go to the forest and find the Syamantaka jewel. Along with the important men of Dwarka city, Krishna went to search out Prasena, the brother of Satrajit, and he found him dead, killed by the lion. At the same time, Krishna also found the lion which had been killed by Jambavan. It was found that the lion had been killed without any assistance from any weapon. Krishna, along with the citizens of Dwarka, then found in the forest a great tunnel. This tunnel was said to be the path to the house of Jambavan, the king of the gorillas. Krishna knew that the inhabitants of Dwarka would be afraid to enter the My tunnel. dear friends, please remain here outside the tunnel. I will go in alone and retrieve the Syamantaka jewel. The cave was dark and foreboding, and full of strange creatures. Not long after entering the tunnel, 
Krishna saw that the very valuable jewel, known as Syamantaka, had been given to the son of Jambavan as a toy. And in order to take the jewel from the child, he went there and stood before him. When the nurse, who was taking care of Jambavan's child, saw Krishna standing before her, she was afraid, thinking the valuable Syamantaka jewel might be taken away by him. You're going to take this jewel away from my boy! Oh, no! Stop! See! Trespassers! Jambavan, help! Oh, see! Ah! Hearing the nurse crying, Jambavan appeared on the scene in a very angry mood. Jambavan was actually a very great devotee of Lord Krishna. But because he was in an angry mood, he could not recognize his master. He thought him to be an ordinary man. This brings to mind the statement in the Bhagavad Gita, in which the Lord advises Arjuna to get free from anger, greed, and lust, in order to rise up to the spiritual platform. Lust, anger, and greed run parallel in the heart and check one's progress upon the spiritual path. Not recognizing his master, Jambavan first challenged him to a fight. Prepare to meet your doom, O oh foul trespasser and thief. There is no mortal in all the three worlds who can withstand the force of my sword. There was then a great fight between Krishna and Jambavan, in which they fought like two opposing vultures. Whenever there is an eatable corpse, the vultures fight very heartily over the prey. Krishna and Jambavan, first of all, began to fight with weapons. Then they fought with stones. Then with big trees. <laughs> then, hand to hand, until at last they were hitting each other with their fists, and the blows were like the striking of thunderbolts. Each was expecting victory over the other, but the fighting continued for days, both in the daytime and at night, without stop. This way, the fighting continued for 28 days and nights. Although Jambavan was the strongest living entity of that time, practically all the joints of his bodily limbs became slackened, and his strength was reduced to practically nil after being constantly struck by the fists of three Krishna. Feeling very tired, with perspiration all over his body, Jambavan was astonished. Who was this opponent who was weakening him? <coughs> Jambavan was quite aware of his own superhuman bodily strength. When he felt tired from being struck by Krishna, he could understand that Krishna is no one else but his worshipable Lord, the Supreme Personality of God. In a sporting attitude, Krishna wanted to engage in a mock fight with his devotee. The Supreme Personality of Godhead has all the propensities and instincts of a human being. Sometimes, in a sportive spirit, he wishes to fight and make a show of bodily strength, and when he so desires, he selects one of his suitable devotees to give him that pleasure. Krishna desired this pleasure of mock fighting with Jambavan. Although Jambavan was a devotee by nature, he was without knowledge of Krishna while giving service to the Lord by his bodily strength. But as soon as Krishna was pleased by the fighting, Jambavan immediately understood that his opponent was none other than the Supreme Lord himself. The conclusion is that he could understand Krishna by his devotional service. Jamavan therefore said unto the Lord, My dear Lord, 
I can now understand who you are. You are the supreme personality of Godhead, Lord Vishnu, the source of everyone's strength. Wealth, reputation, beauty, wisdom, and renunciation. My dear Lord, you are the creator of the creators of the universal affairs. You are not only creator of the creators, but you are also creator of the material elements which are manipulated by the so-called creators. Scientists utilize the physical elements or laws of material nature to do something wonderful. But actually, such laws and such elements are also the creation of Krishna. This is actual scientific knowledge. Less intelligent men do not try to understand who created the brain of the scientist. They are simply satisfied by seeing the wonderful creation or invention of the scientist. Jamavan continued to address Lord Krishna. My dear Lord, the time factor which combines all the physical elements is also your representative. You are the supreme time factor in which all creation takes place, is maintained, and is finally annihilated. And not only the physical elements and the time factors, but also the persons who manipulate the ingredients and advantages of creation are but part and parcel of you. The living entity is not, therefore, an independent creator. By studying all factors in the right perspective, one can see that you are the supreme controller and lord of everything. My dear Lord, I can therefore understand that you are the same Supreme Personality of Godhead whom I worship as Lord Ramchandra. My Lord Ramchandra wanted to construct a bridge over the ocean, and I saw personally how the ocean became agitated simply by my Lord's glancing over it. And when the whole ocean became agitated, the living entities, like the whale, alligators, and timing gillyfish, all became perturbed. In this way, the ocean was forced to give way and allow Ramchandra to cross to the island known as Lanka or Ceylon. This construction of a bridge over the ocean from Cape Comorin to Ceylon is still well known to everyone. After the construction of the bridge, a fire was set all over the kingdom of Ravana. During the fighting with Ravan, each and every part of Ravan's limbs was slashed and cut into pieces by your sharp arrows, and his head fell to the face of the earth. I can understand that you are none other than my lord Ramchandra. No one else has such immeasurable strength. No one else could defeat me in this way. Lord Krishna became satisfied by the prayers and the statements of Jambavan, and to mitigate the pains of his body, he began to smear the lotus palm of his hand all over the body of Jambavan. Jambavan at once felt relieved from the fatigue of the great fight. Lord Krishna then addressed him as King Jambavan. My dear King Jambavan, it is you and not the lion who is actually the king of the jungle. For you have killed the lion in its cave with your bare hand. I have come to ask you for the Syamantaka jewel. For since the jewel was stolen, my name has been defamed in the city of Dwarka. Krishna plainly informed him that he had come there to ask for the jewel in order to be free from this defamation. Jambavan understood the whole situation. And to satisfy the Lord, he not only immediately delivered the Syamantaka jewel, but he also brought his daughter, Jambavati, who was of marriageable age, and presented her to Lord Krishna. Although the fighting between Krishna and Jambavan went on for 28 days, the inhabitants of Dwarka waited outside the tunnel for only 12 days. After that, they decided that something undesirable must have happened. 
They could not understand what had actually happened for certain. And being very sorry and tired, they had returned to the city of Dorka. All the members of the family, namely the mother of Krishna, Devaki, and his father, Vasudeva, and his chief wife, Rukmini, along with all the other friends and relatives and residents of the palace, became very sorry when the citizens of Dwarka returned home without Krishna. Because of their natural affection for Krishna, they began to call Satrajit ill names, for he was the cause of Krishna's disappearance. Suddenly, however, Krishna appeared on the scene, accompanied by his new wife, Jambavati, and all the inhabitants of Dwarka, and the relatives of Krishna became joyful once again. The inhabitants of Dwarka became as joyful as someone receiving a dear relative back from the dead. The inhabitants of Dwarka had concluded that Krishna had been put into great difficulties due to the fighting. Therefore, they had become almost hopeless of his return. But when they saw that Krishna had actually returned, and not alone but with a new wife, Jambavati, they immediately performed another celebration and ceremony. King Ugrasena then called for a meeting of all the important kings and chiefs. He also invited Satrajit. And Krishna explained before the whole assembly the incident of the recovery of the jewel from Jambavan. Krishna wanted to return the valuable jewel to King Satrajit. Satrajit, however, became ashamed that he had unnecessarily defamed Krishna. He accepted the jewel in his hand, but he remained silent bending his head downwards and without speaking anything in the assembly of the kings and chiefs he returned home with the jewel he thought about how he could clear himself from the abominable action he had performed by defaming Krishna I have offended Krishna very grievously and I must rectify it so that Krishna will again be pleased King Satrajit was very eager to gain relief from the anxiety that he had foolishly created due to being attracted to a material thing, specifically this Yamantaka jewel. Satrajit was truly affected by the offense he had committed towards Lord Krishna, and he sincerely wanted to rectify it. From within, Krishna gave him good intelligence. I know. Not only will I return the valuable Yamantaka jewel, but I will also give Krishna the hand of my very beautiful daughter, Sashabhama, in marriage. There was no alternative for mitigating the situation, and therefore, he arranged the marriage ceremony of Krishna and his beautiful daughter. He gave in charity both the jewel and his daughter to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Satchibhama was so beautiful and qualified that Satrajit, in spite of being asked for the hand of Satchibhama by many princes, was waiting to find a suitable son-in-law. By the grace of Krishna, he decided to hand his daughter over to him. Lord Krishna, being pleased upon Satrajit, informed him that he did not have any need of the Salman Takaju. It is better that you let it remain in the temple as you have kept it. And every one of us will derive benefit from the jewel. Because of the jewel's presence in the city of Dwarka, there will be no more famine or disturbances created by pestilence or excessive heat and cold. Actually, Krishna's presence alone assures all auspiciousness and it is said that anyone who hears or describes the story of this Yamantaka jewel or simply remembers it will be freed from all kinds of defamation and the reactions of all impious activities and will thus attain the highest perfectional condition of peace.